Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm your host, Troy Moling. Thanks for joining us today. This is my first show for Market Journal, and we've got a good one in store. On this week's episode, DTN Green Analyst Todd Holtman gives his take on some current crop conditions. Jessica Coulterman from Lincoln Premium Poultry tells us what retailer they're partnering with and why they want to get into the chicken processing business. Dr. Mike Bain talks about the latest developments with Nebraska Extension and the Haskell Agriculture Lab. Plus, Wes Peterson discusses current trade wars and what it could mean for your bottom line. The latest USDA crop progress report continues to show favorable conditions across much of the country. When it comes to corn, 68% of the crop is rated good to excellent. As for soybeans, USDA says 65% of the crop is good to excellent, and as a whole, 91% of the crop is in the fill stage, which is 8% above average. Spring wheat continues to exceed estimates, too. DTN Grain Analyst Todd Holtman has an opinion on all the things crops. He's our market analyst this week and tells us some of his major takeaways from the report. Well, of course, uh, USDA uh, estimated a record corn yield, uh, and that might have, uh, or I should say that's under debate right now as uh, we continue to uh, look at the field and the crops. And we've also had a digital survey here at DTN, which suggests maybe a slightly lower yield than what USDA said. But we'll continue to talk about that as the months progress. But overall, it set us off on a bearish course in corn. 14.6 billion bushel crop is, is another nice big crop this year, if that comes true. And it seems reasonable that we've had good weather. We've had good adequate moisture across most of the Midwest. And here in August especially, the temperatures have been nice and moderate. Uh, on the soybean side, they estimated another record soybean harvest, 4.6 billion bushels. And remember that comes on the heels of a record soybean harvest that we had earlier this year from Brazil. So soybean supplies are not seen as a problem right now. What are your thoughts on global wheat production and how that may impact U.S. farmers going forward? Yeah, wheat's been a very interesting market this year, and that's uh, something I haven't said for a long time, Troy. Um, we started out with uh, really, of course, we had our concerns here in the Southwest Plains over the winter. It was dry and, and we had drought developed. Uh, but there's always, uh, we've had situations before where we can have a drought here in the Southwest Plains and the rest of the world grows a lot of wheat. Well, this year it seemed like one by one we started hearing about a problem after another problem. It started with Southern Russia and we hear Australia's dry. Uh, last month we started to hear more about uh, Europe being dry. And, um, and uh, even now in the northwestern U.S., we've, we've got areas of drought and concern in the Canadian western prairie that maybe production will be down a little bit. So this, this scenario of lower world wheat production has kind of grown gradually throughout the year. And right now USDA is looking at about a 4% drop from world production of a year ago. Uh, International Grain Council, which is out of the U.K., actually expects a 5% drop. So this is um, a, a significant drop in our wheat supply outlook, and I think that's one thing that's been helping wheat prices just up until about a week ago. So really strong corn crop again this season, maybe a little background on how that's going to affect farmers going forward. Yes, well, uh, from now until harvest time, you know, the seasonal low for corn prices typically comes in early October. And as long as we have a big corn harvest, as it looks like we're going to have, whether it's 14.6 or 14.5, uh, is really not going to change the outlook for that. We're going to have bearish pressure because we also have a 2 billion bushel carry from the previous season that we have to remember. So we're going to have plenty of corn supplies available this fall and we expect our typical seasonal low that we normally see probably early October. From that point on, corn should see a better demand season from world exports this year and part of that's thanks to the drought that we had in Argentina earlier this year and then Brazil's uh, corn crop has also been down earlier this year due to uh, concerns about dry weather. So uh, this is uh, one time when USDA is expecting lower ending world stocks at the end of the 2018-19 season and that should translate into better uh, export opportunities for the U.S. Alright, so corn's in good shape for the U.S. Looks like soybeans pretty good shape for them 
as well. Uh, thoughts so, on that? Yeah, soybean supplies are in good shape. The question is, what's soybean demand going to be? And that's something where it's just uh, almost impossible to guess in this political environment. Uh, even as we speak, Chinese and U.S. officials are meeting in Washington and uh, seeing if they can hammer out any progress on this trade dispute that's been going on and, of course, has resulted in a 25 percent tariff against our U.S. soybeans. Uh, that obviously remains a bearish concern and, and has probably knocked our U.S. soybean price down at least $1.20 a bushel, if not more, uh, simply because of that tariff. Uh, now, moving forward, I think it's very tough to predict where these trade policy changes are going to go. Are, is there going to be a resolution anytime soon? Uh, will we be able to get back in China's good graces at some point? That remains a question to be seen. And uh, typically, China's uh, most vulnerable time of needing U.S. soybeans is October to February. So we're getting close to that period. And it's going to be very interesting to see just uh, if the trade dispute continues, how little of U.S. soybeans can they get by with uh, through that time period? Or will they just uh, uh, basically have to uh, deal with the tariff and move through it? I don't think anyone has a good answer for these questions yet. And without that, it's very hard to estimate what our demand scenario is going to be. So right now, the U.S. Uh, USDA is estimating an ending stocks uh, uh, of soybeans in the new crop season of about 780 million bushels. Well, that could be plus or minus two or 300 million mm -hmm. just on how that demand outlook goes. If you were in that meeting with the Chinese officials, what's the, what's the one thing you'd want to know? Well, I think I would emphasize that, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. needs you as a good customer just as much as you need our soybeans for uh, your importers. And uh, that, that tariff is really hurting both sides. So uh, let's, let's look at a different way of talking about our differences. I think that's where I would try to steer it. All right. And uh, fall's coming up just a few weeks away. Uh, any more predictions as we get closer to fall? Well, unfortunately, the weather is so good, it's hard to argue with USDA's crop estimates right now. And as long as those uh, big harvests are impending upon us, uh, it's, it's very tough to find any buyers who want to run right in there and get in front of this freight train. So uh, I think as typically we are this time of year, we're going to have to endure through this low price period. But uh, the demand on the other side uh, should look a little better. Next week, Lee Schultz from Iowa State will join us to discuss cattle on feed report. Retail giant Costco already has a handful of stores in Nebraska. Now it's making its mark in a new way. They're teaming up with Lincoln Premium Poultry in order to construct a processing plant. It'll be located in Fremont and will supply chicken for stores across the nation. And get this, they may be interested in partnering with your farm. Market Journal's Jerry Renault spoke with Lincoln Premium Poultry's Jessica Coulterman to find out how this project came about and why it's different than many other corporate operations. Lincoln Premium Poultry is a company that was created here in Nebraska a couple of years ago uh, for Costco in collaboration with Costco. So our values reflect Costco's values, um, but we are our own independent company and we are going to be the people that put together and implement their poultry program to raise poultry and process poultry for their stores. Uh, tell us about um, the, the, the new project and give us a little bit of an update on where things are. Yeah, the project's really exciting. Um, it's here in Nebraska. It's being built uh, on the industrial area near Fremont, right outside of Fremont to the south. Um, we will have a poultry processing complex. We will have a feed mill and we will have a hatchery. Uh, that's the complex part of the project uh, there in Fremont. And then in addition to that, we will have grower partners all across the region who will raise the poultry for our project in their barns on their farms. And then that poultry will feed into our processing facility. So we will have approximately 100 to 125 farmer partners in the region uh, who will provide poultry to the operation for uh, that will eventually end up in Costco warehouse stores around the country. Is this a unique way of doing this? It is. Uh, most retailers will, will partner with a, a, a vendor of sort, someone who raises poultry, um, but they don't own uh, the operations that, that process that poultry. So um, Costco saw this as a way to really um, kind of manifest their own destiny with, with poultry. So chicken consumption is raising 
uh, across you know, the United States. People like chicken, people like Costco chicken. Uh, the rotisserie bird, which is what one of the focuses of this project, um, is very popular in the Costco stores. I found out when I started working on this project that the rotisserie bird has its own Facebook page with oh you know, thousands of people following it, very excited <laughs> about all the opportunities to eat rotisserie chicken from Costco. So um, this gives them the opportunity to really focus on what kind of product they want. They can um, make sure that this product is raised the way they want it to. They can have a relationship with the farmers that they partner with, and they can control the uh, the health of the bird, the quality of the bird, how the bird is processed, and, and know that they always have birds coming in that they'll have enough product for their stores. So if a producer is interested in getting involved, what yeah. should they do? Well, they can reach out to us. Um, we have a, a really great team of uh, people that work with our growers to develop those partnerships. And they will then talk to them about what would this look like for a grower who would want to go through this process um, and consider growing poultry for, for this project. So there is a required investment from the grower. They would need to put in these barns on their farm. Uh, so they would invest in the barns. And then we would have a partnership with them through a contract for them to grow that bird for us that would eventually feed into our system. Now, I know there have been some concerns about water quality and odor and some of those mm -hmm. kinds of things. What are you doing to uh, allay people's concerns? Well, there's two things. Um, first of all, with water quality, this project, um, anyone who's raising uh, broilers in Nebraska, they would have a dry litter product at the end. Um, so the, the chicken litter that comes out of these barns is dry which means that they would not necessarily, um, in most cases, be required to have a Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality permit. But we, as a company, are requiring those growers to have permits anyway. So they will be required to go through the DEQ permitting process and get a state operating permit, which, which provides a very strict level of accountability that will show how they're managing their litter, where that litter is going to be deposited as fertilizer, and all the, all the specifics will be documented and there will be accountability there. Um, we believe that's a really important step to protect the environment in Nebraska, to protect the groundwater, to protect any concern, you know, protect their neighbors, anybody that would have concerns. That should um, basically satisfy any concerns that would exist on water quality. In terms of odor, we are using the University of Nebraska Odor Footprint oh. uh, for all of our growers, which is a fabulous tool. I'm so glad we have it. Um, that basically will show that it takes the weather patterns, it takes humidity, it takes the type of barns, it takes the animal units, it takes all these factors and it puts it into a beautiful little package that can show on a map where the odor will be 95, 96, 97% of the time. And in, in most every case that I've seen in Nebraska with this kind of project, most of that odor will be contained in a quarter of a mile from the, from the location. Are there some zoning issues as well? Well, the neat thing about Nebraska, uh, it's kind of one of those things that we as Nebraskas know, we have local zoning. So every single county, everywhere you go is a little bit different. And so one of the, um, my job and, and my team's job, the, the great people that I work with on this, is to look at the local zoning and, and figure out specifically what does this county require, what does this area require, okay. and then we work with our growers to move through those nuances of their specific area and what the zoning looks like. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things we're trying to do to um, be good neighbors, to make sure that we are being very safe, being very responsible, um, and really contributing in positive ways to the state. If you think your farm would be a good fit for the program, contact us at Market Journal and we'll get you in touch with Jessica. Nebraska Extension is a statewide program that strives to give growers the latest information on crop and livestock research to help improve production. For the Northeast Nebraska District, the Haskell Agriculture Lab does exactly that. We spoke with Agriculture and Natural Resources Vice Chancellor Dr. Mike Bame at the recent Haskell Ag Lab open house to learn more about Nebraska Extension facilities. Our research extension and education centers across Nebraska extend, uh, give us a tool really, a vehicle to extend our teaching and learning, our research and, ex and extension work uh, across all 93 counties. I mean, that's the bottom line. So we are here in uh, just east of Concord, Nebraska at the Haskell Ag Laboratory. 
and uh, we are having a climate and crops field day, which is just uh, spectacular. It is a vibrant engagement. This this is this is uh, this is what we hope to see at our at our research, teaching, and extension centers around the state. You know, the good news about Nebraska is that we have one state university. We have one state university that has five campuses, including the Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture. We have six community colleges uh, designed, uh, located throughout the state, and we have three state colleges. So as far as Nebraska's higher education system, it's amazing that system interacts with our 245 public school systems. So from pre-K through 12, connecting then with our two-year programming, connected with our four-year programming and beyond. So I think the, the bottom line is we all owe it to our state to help grow Nebraska. We do that through investing in people, and those people then um, when they have uh, desires for education, when they have questions about their production systems, whether that's livestock farming or cropping systems. The university system, the land-grant university system in America, really has two amazing powers, if you will, superhero powers. One is the ability to discover and provide objective, evidence-based, science-based information to those who can use it to move their, their own, their own uh, health and well-being and vitality forward. Second is the power to convene. We have the opportunity to bring people from different walks of life with different perspectives and to bring them together in a way where they can explore difference and think about common, common good and then figure out ways to work collaboratively to move the needle forward. So that is really the essence of the land-grant university. And um, you know, I think at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, certainly in the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources, where we um, have almost 1,800 men and women every day who show up to work, who are thinking about the success of others, it's a powerful recipe for success. And today here at Haskell Ag Lab, we're seeing that. For more information on the Haskell Ag Lab and other Extension sites, visit extension.unl.edu. When a piece of farm equipment breaks down, you can rest easy in knowing your replacement part will be compatible with your existing machinery. That's all thanks to ISOBUS and the Agricultural Industry Electronics Foundation. Now that intercommunication is being taken to a new level. AEF Chairman Peter Vanderflut says seamless wireless data transfer and automated functions like Tractor Implement Management or TIM are two key areas of focus. You can read about these functions and AEF's approach to testing these functions across brands in the August Nebraska Farmer. There's been a lot of media attention on U.S. trade policy in recent weeks, but history tells us trade wars haven't been uncommon. Canada, Mexico, China, and the EU have been recent targets of U.S. tariffs. As a result, they've all declared their intention to retaliate with tariffs of their own, and most have also filed complaints with the World Trade Organization. We spoke with the University of Nebraska agriculture economist Wes Peterson about the ongoing U.S. trade war. Uh, originally, tariffs were used to raise government revenue. We didn't have an income tax, so we got our government. We financed our government with tariffs, uh, and so tariffs have been around forever. The countries have always taxed foreign stuff, and, and, and so on. Um, but it has led to these, these big problems where you have a trade war, and, and I think the big point is that nobody wins a trade war. You always lose. Uh, uh, because, first of all, consumers pay more, uh, as you put on uh, tariffs. Uh, and also, the uh, people forget about this, but there are a lot of industries that import inputs to, to uh, and so they end up then having to pay more for their inputs. And, and so, uh, so the first thing is countries always lose, uh, just, just w without thinking about the possibility that other countries may retaliate. This is it's bad for the U.S. to have uh, high protectionism. But then the other part of the deal 
is that once you put on these tariffs and start protecting your industries, other countries retaliate. Uh, that's exactly what's going on now with, with uh, China, for example, a major market for U.S. soybeans uh, has started to, uh, or is threatening to put on tariffs uh, on soybeans. Uh, soybean prices have gone down. As a result, uh, China will be getting its soybeans from Brazil and Argentina. Uh, and, you know, it, this will hurt uh, uh, farmers in, in the U.S. We, 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 there was a conference recently where the, this group, uh, uh, somebody from the group made a uh, presentation. This is Farmers for Free Trade. You can look it up. It's at farmersforfreetrade.com. And, and their goal is to uh, advance uh, the, the show to people the importance to agriculture of, of free trade. So uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's the, the real crux here. The, the World Trade Organization uh, was started in 95. It incorporated the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which is started after the Second World War. They, they both function by getting uh, countries together to negotiate uh, uh, trade liberalization, the lowering or elimination of trade barriers of all sorts. Now, I initially, agriculture was not in this system. And so during uh, the, prior to 1995, there were a lot of conflicts over agriculture. We had fights with the Europeans over bananas and chickens and hormones and beef and so on. Uh, with the World Trade Organization, the, the dispute uh, settlement processes were, were strengthened. So basically what countries do is, is uh, they agree on rules for international trade, and then they make commitments. They say, we, will, uh, we commit to lower our tariffs into this amount. If a country thinks that, that uh, another country has violated its commitments, then there is, that can trigger the dispute settlement process. Typically what happens is that the countries that bring a case uh, generally win and the countries against whom the case is brought generally lose. That's been the case in the United States. About 90% of the cases we've brought against other countries we've won. About 90% of the cases brought against the United States we've lost. And that's the same for most other countries as well. The, the question about what's going to happen at the WTO, I think it's, it's probably pretty clear. Uh, the other, the, all the countries on which, where we've put tariffs, they have all responded by saying they're going to raise tariffs on, on, on the U.S. as well in retaliation. That's typical of a trade war. Uh, and, and so um, we will probably lose those. Uh, the, the grounds for the steel tariffs was national security, but that's kind of ridiculous because the tariffs are applied to our allies, Canada and Europe and so on. Uh, the uh, tariffs on China, uh, is because of currency manipulations and intellectual property questions. And some of those are legitimate concerns, but, but we will probably lose on that because we applied the tariffs. Whereas if we'd gotten together with our Europeans and, and Canada and so on and filed a complaint at the WTO, that would do two things. We'd win. Uh, and uh, secondly, it would strengthen the, this global system that we've been working on for the past 75, 80 years to, to uh, have a rules-based international trade re regime that, that will be beneficial to, to everyone. So how we grow the economy is, is uh, again, you know, it, it's just crazy. Think about um, we had some good trade agreements in the works. The tra Trans-Pacific Partnership would have brought Japan and opened that market to our beef exports. And so that was thrown out. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership was uh, thrown out, and, and, then, and then except that in, just recently, there was an agreement between the European Union and the US, which essentially is reactivating the, the tra trans Transatlantic Trade and, uh, Investment Partnership, TTIP, uh, that, that was under negotiation prior to this administration. So, so those kinds of uh, negotiating trade agreements, uh, actively trying to strengthen and participate in the World Trade Organization, and other international uh, institutions, this is, this is the way that you grow and become prosperous, uh, not only in the U.S., but around the world. Uh, and going, the more prosperous countries are, uh, the more um, likely it is that we'll be busy doing business with each other rather than going to war. Uh, and, and I think that there's a long history that if you've got uh, open markets and, and uh, free trade and so on, uh, that, that you, it's worked beautifully in Europe. So basically, uh, I think you know, the more uh, economic relations you have, the more likely it is to have uh, world peace, and that's a good thing too. Wes says the WTO dispute settlement procedures can be slow, but does provide a way for countries to resolve disputes without getting into a full-blown trade war. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension ad climatologist Al Dutcher. 
Well, folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. And as expected last week, we talked about that heavy precipitation last week and it did come to fruition. Most of the heaviest of the moisture was in south central and southeast Nebraska. Up through east central Nebraska, the Omaha, south Omaha area received unofficially up to six inches in some unofficial reports pushing the seven inch range. Two to four inches was very common across southeast Nebraska. One to two across southeast or south central Nebraska, and then lesser totals as you move toward the north and west. And then we had a repeat performance of thunderstorm activity south of the interstate 80 quarter Thursday morning and some redevelopment Thursday afternoon. So now we've set ourselves up with that warm air moving in from that system on Thursday. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we can store for the rest of the weekend. With that warm air in place, it's moved toward the east of us with this little trough, high pressure firmly in control, bringing our winds out of the southwest and the upper atmosphere, low pressure at the surface. Um, is going to be very moisture starved, so most of the precipitation that's going to occur is going to occur well east of this region ahead of the warm front as the low pressures build toward the east. As we get into Sunday, we get a strong southwesterly flow in the atmosphere. Probably the warmest day of the seven day period. Low pressure is going to develop over western South Dakota, and that will keep a southwest flow from the surface into our region. Most of the precipitation is to the north of us. Temperatures should be well into the 90s. 90 to 95 looks to be pretty much persistent across the state. As we get into Monday, we see this trough trying to lift out into the northern plains. We have a surface low developing in western Kansas that will allow to bring some moisture up into our region, but it looks like the brunt of the focus of that moisture will be to the north of us, particularly northern Iowa, southern Minnesota. And then as we get on the day on Tuesday, that trough starts to move toward the Great Lakes and tries to deepen somewhat. But we have high pressure firmly in control over Nebraska, low pressure down in Texas. That'll point the, pump the moisture up to the east of us and north of us. So the major intersection of moisture once again appears to be the upper Great Lakes region. And then that trough kind of dies out somewhat. We still have that southwest to northeastern flow in the upper atmosphere, high pressure over the central plains, looks to keep us basically into the 80s across the state with most of the precipitation still staying to the east of us. Now as the day we get into the day on Thursday, we start to flatten out the flow, a little zonal flow. That means that we're going to see a little bit milder temperature, maybe just to back off a couple degrees on our temperatures. Low pressure developing once again in north central portions of South Dakota. That allows some more moisture conversion. It looks like it's targeting eastern Nebraska and western Iowa with the best chances for moisture. And then that system passes to the east and we still remain in a zonal flow for Friday. Temperatures will rebound somewhat, but we have a series of low pressure system lining up that may allow some moisture to move toward the north and generate some precipitation, particularly from Iowa and points to the east. The 8 to 14 day forecast from next Thursday to the following Tuesday keeps the warm temperatures in place and in terms of precipitation brings dry conditions to the central plains. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. And make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter to join in on the conversation. Next week, Lee Schultz from Iowa State will join us to discuss the Cattle on Feed Report. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.